Hello everyone, welcome to the Jenkins Infrastructure Team Meeting. So today we are 27 August 2024. Around the virtual table, we have a lot of people. That's the end of the holidays or days off or whatever. So um, Hervé is not with us. Uh, uh, we have myself, Damien Duportal, Mark White, Stéphane Merle. Uh, Bruno is not there either. We have Kevin Martin Sanjay already. Oh, I need to update the template for Jay. Go 999. Okay. Did I miss someone? Uh, Jay, the shared notes are in the conversation here. I don't know if you have them. If you yeah, don't, I'm may... Okay, perfect. So let's get started with announcements. So last week, uh, we had the weekly release 2.473 that was released successfully. By successfully, I mean uh, available to an user on time with changelog. Under the hood, uh, we uh, the slow OS USL blocking the package release is back. So it's not a blocker for the release itself, but it starts to be really annoying. Uh, we'll discuss this for September, but just to note that yeah, sometimes that package build need to be aborted after 40 minutes, usually. It has a timeout of one or two hours, but usually we react before and that's not a problem. We just have to wait for the mirrors to pick the new bits. And this week, the weekly release started on time. So we have to wait uh, still two hours before having the package. Any question on the weekly releases? that we had last week or this week? Nope, okay. On the announcement, so some of you already seen, um, after having Jira being uh, spammed, now we have GitHub Jenkins Infra organization. Uh, since yesterday, we start to have automatic uh, comments uh, from bot accounts. So each time we ban the account immediately and we hide the comments, so Daniel Beck uh, told us that with the um, he opened a few requests on GitHub so they can do something on the abuse request. Uh, so let's write yeah, it. There and and this is a major spam across the entire GitHub infrastructure uh, exactly. environment. So it's this is widespread and getting lots of complaints in the. GitHub community, forums, et cetera. So many, many places are being spammed with this. Subject to this. So no wonder they will find a solution, I believe, in the upcoming weeks. So they will deliver uh, features to help us in that area. On short term, uh, if you see this command, uh, we can ban immediately the users. So you have a feature at least Stefan, Mark, and I, I don't know for Jay and Kevin, but if you are on a repository where you have enough uh, power, you can select on the details about the command, you can select uh, block the user. And there is a checkbox to select saying, uh, also hide the command with a reason, usually it's spam. And so you can, no, no need to let the user know, because if it's automated, that will just add overload on GitHub infrastructure. Uh, but block until we decide uh, we can remove them. Why not removing the commands because abuse requests need traces and audits? And also because if these accounts are uh, le usually legit accounts that have been uh, uh, act, removing everything could be a problem because maybe we want to unblock them if they can prove they are legit user taking over again the account from the hack. We still don't know. So we should not delete things right now, just hide them. Uh, and also because the content of the commands are just links. It's not an attack where they upload data on the Jenkins Infra repository that they could use somewhere else, such as a screenshot updates. That, that kind of attack would have justified to delete the commands to, in order to have a garbage collect of the attached files. That's not the case. So unless they change their attack vector, Right now it's only text, so it's okay to just hide them. User and hide command. Any question? Mm -hmm. 
No, no other announcement. Nope, okay, so let's have a look at the upcoming calendar. Uh, next week, uh, we will have a weekly release, third, uh, third day of September 2024. The weekly release will be 2.475. Uh, important thing, Mark, can you confirm But that weekly release should have GT12 EE9. So that's part of the Spring Security 6 that, project. That is currently the goal. Now, there's a risk that it may have to wait until the 10th, but that is... It is currently the goal to, to have Spring Security 6 included in that 3 September release. Cool. Congratulations to everyone involved in that work. So that means we will have to be careful, Stefan, after delivering to InfraCI, if we see anything weird on the controller, we have to report it because that could be something related to that. Right. Uh, and and you, usual. you need to pay extra attention to it because I will be out that week. Oh. And so I won't be watching it. So I need someone else to watch it. So everyone is aware of this. Thank you. Um, also next week, uh, Wednesday, we will do a reminder during the next weekly meeting. But Wednesday for September, we will have a dot .do LTS release with Alex Brandes, not my fault, uh, uh, as re release lead. Uh, please note that the next baseline selection will happen 18 September. So nothing for the upcoming week, but immediately the week after we'll have these releases. We don't have uh, announced, oh, there is a wasp here. Uh, we don't have any security release announced. Uh, so that's a good thing or not, I don't know. I let you the sole judge of that. Um, calendar about the upcoming credentials. So all the credentials from last week has been uh, rotated. And we have the VPN CRL expiration that will happen the 6th September 2024. So I've opened an issue and it's on triage right now. Uh, so Stefan or I are autonomous to deliver this one. Uh, Jay, not yet. So Stefan, uh, we will see who will do this one. Maybe a uh, An easy one for you to get started yeah, from after three exactly weeks of holidays. Exactly what I was thinking of. So we have an issue. It's on triage. We will uh, look on it uh, later. I don't see other upcoming credential expiration for the upcoming three weeks. We have two major events where you will be able to meet Jenkins contributor. First, uh, in September 17. September, that will be online, the DevOps world. Uh, all of the Jenkins board member and officers will have a tiny slot for presentation. That will be an opportunity for Q&A. So see it's, since it's online, don't hesitate, don't be shy and attend and ask question if you have some. You will also be lucky to meet Bruno and Olivier Vernon on the CD Mini Summit in Vienna, 19 September, if you are in, in the area. That's all for the upcoming calendar. Do you have something else about announcement or calendar, folks? Nope. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the cloud budgets. So let's start with the Azure CDF paid accounts. So we have consumed 3.8K uh, today. The forecast is at 4.5, so we are in our goals. That's really cool. Uh, I wanted to try adding an image. Let's see if we can see it. I tried, yes, it's just loading really slowly, but you can see for this month, um, a state of the, the, uh, the how much did we have, have we been billed per day since the 1st of August. And I've tried to group by category of uh, expense. So that doesn't, That gives some details, not enough detail. We need other views, but that's to give you an order of magnitudes. So most, as you can see, most of the billing come from virtual machines. Uh, follow close. So the second one are NAT gateway. That, that's the bandwidth that goes from one network to another network, mainly data we download. Uh, and we And the data downloaded by our users. And the third one is the Redis cache. So that's uh, all the services behind the Redis instances used by Get Jenkins IO and the new update center. 
Uh, then we have storage followed closely by Azure DNS and bandwidth. So most of our costs are now related to network, which means we are close to the limit of we cannot compress more the cost. We still have the Redis and virtual machines that could be uh, areas where we could gain, but yeah, we start to have uh, packed as much as possible as we can for this account. Any question on this one? So we are under the line. However, I've opened an issue that will be on the next um, on the next milestone about Redis instances. It's not only about the cost, but also about security uh, and safety of the new update center. But that could allow us to remove per, uh, all the Redis cost from that account by moving it to the sponsored account and merging two uh, Redis instances in one. We'll discuss this later, but that's one source of compressing costs. Uh, since we were able to run mirror bits instances with ARM64, uh, this month, middle of August, we were able to decrease the size of the of one of our cluster of one virtual machine, which means we still have one virtual machine and only one with Intel and application workload, the workload being the LDAP. So we are close to removing another virtual machine. That's a gain of, on a full month, we can expect 200 bucks uh, economy per virtual machine. Uh, finally, I've opened a third issue about migrating private cluster to the new sponsored account. Again, it's not big, mainly driven by cost. It's also for safety and modernization of the setup. But cost can be interesting because that these are things that the CDF wouldn't have to pay during the upcoming three to five months. Again, triage, we'll discuss this later because it's a matter of priority. About Azure sponsorship accounts, so the account mainly used by CI Jenkins IO builds, uh, we have consumed 8.4K. We have a forecast a bit below 10K, like last month. So mainly spent on uh, BOM builds, and uh, plugin and build related to the spring security projects. So we can expect in September that cost to decrease a bit or not. If we move Redis and the private cluster that might balance, but these are credits we need to consume before May, 2025. So that's good for consuming. Any question about Azure? Okay, so in that case, next one will be Digital Ocean. So DigitalOcean, we still have 16K. We have consumed 4K since the beginning of the year. Uh, this is valid until January 2025. So it's valid for the current year. Uh, we might lose that credits. That depends on our priority, because if we don't consume it, we don't know if it will be renewed or not. Um, yeah, I want to discuss this next week, if it's okay for everyone. All could we optimize our spend for the upcoming four months, from September to December. Finally, on AWS, uh, I didn't have time to, to check the consumption, so I will do it after the meeting. The forecast was still at 6.5K 6 now, uh, mainly bandwidth uh, from the update center. 95% mainly. We are also have 60K credits valid until January 2025 that we could spend. So first, any question about these cloud budgets? No, no question for me. Congratulations on everyone keeping us under budget. And thanks to the Spring Security team and to Microsoft for donating to allow the Spring Security team to do what they needed to do in terms of test execution. That extra cost has, has been a great benefit for us to be ready to ship Spring Security 6 at the end of October. Absolutely, that's really, that's really cool. So next week I will come with a plan proposal and I might use an issue uh, about how could we move different elements of the infrastructure to try using and, and spread the use of credits between AWS new accounts, Digital Ocean current account, and Azure sponsorship. Main challenge is that Azure sponsorship have, has almost 60 
credits that we can use until May 2025. So we start to be on the area where these credits should be, um, uh, let's say, kept as much as possible in order to be efficient. And then we should start using data on the um, credit on Digital Ocean and AWS. So let's let's move now on the task of the up, the milestone that we just finished. So what were we able to finish during this milestone? Uh, first step, we have revoked Hervé Lemur access. It's temporary measure, Hervé is not going anywhere and we haven't had any issue, but he had a hardware issue on his laptop with his personal keys and this is an administrator. Um, that means he will, bring it to a repair chip. And also it looks like he has backup issues. So that means we will have to rotate uh, GPG key, all of his VPN certificate, SSH key. So every element he has across the infrastructure, he still have access to some of his accounts. However, someone else that we don't know and we cannot trust by default will have access to his machine. Even though his machine should be encrypted, the exploit exists. So in order to be really sure, we just revoked all of his accesses and he will ask for accesses once he will have a repaired machine and he will have time to spend on the infrastructure. So better safe than sorry on that area. Uh, two notes. That has been an opportunity to start cleaning up elements on GitHub organization Jenkins Infra on the VPN and on Azure. Azure, uh, so I've confirmed, for instance, that uh, with Kosuke, that Kosuke doesn't need an account on uh, Azure. And he was administrator. And since we have to enforce MFA everywhere, he told me better to remove his account on, uh, on Azure, for instance. We also removed a few teams on GitHub organization that were unused. And we discovered that if you remove someone from an organization on GitHub, it looks like if that person is the either only owner, code owner of a team, or if you remove a team that has child, children teams, then it will automatically remove everything. So we have these teams that have been removed as when removing Hervé from others. So it looks like some of this team Hervé was either the creator or the only owner of this team, such as monitoring. For other, we still don't know. CI maintainer, I'm not sure why, it has been deleted. These teams were not used. These were just group of person with permission or repositories, but the members of these teams were all on other teams. So I believe we have used them for some times and forgot. So let's, I propose we see that as a summer cleanup. And if you see anyone there's permission access, don't hesitate to open an help desk and we will recreate the permission right now. So for people who have seen Star Wars, you know how important it is to revoke credentials when they are not needed. Yes, some, some uh, imperial office, officer would say, that's an old code, sir, but it still checks out. Yes, we don't want that. <laughs> Any question about that uh, temporary revocation? No objection, no problem? Good, thanks. Uh, we have had an issue due uh, with get Jenkins IO mirror bit instance that for 55% request, it was saying, hey, I cannot geolocate your request, so let me send you to a mirror on the other side of the earth. So the service was not broken down, but it was not really good in terms of network latency and distribution. The problem was, Samba CFS locks on a shared file system. I mean, it's 2002 again, folks. <laughs> and even when using Microsoft Azure, we, we still have these problems on modern architectures. Um, so for now, uh, I've reopened the issue about GeoIP updates, which is the software that we regularly update the database of IP geolocation across the world. It's recommended to do it twice a week. And we were facing rate limit on that issue. We fixed that last week by instead of running it on each mirror bit instance, each time it was restarted. So four mirror bit instance, two deployment per week, we start to reach the rate limits for downloading this new data. So now the data is on a centralized file system. 
It's a shared file system using Samba CFS. So that's good. It helped Mirrorbit to start without needing to wait for an update, decoupling. However, the update mechanism was trying to write, but Samba says, hey, yes, it's written, but in fact, it's not. And it was a kind of a word state causing the system to retry ad vitam aeternam. So I've purely deleted the update system, reopened the issue, and we will need on the upcoming milestone to work on a process to keep that database updated. Right now, I fixed the issue here by downloading with my personal account the database and uploading it once manually on the system. So uh, reopened GOIP update issue. So Stefan uh, had a, an idea on how to solve this. We will uh, speak about this on the upcoming uh, issue. It's reopened and on triage mode. Uh, we had an account deletion. Someone wanted their account removed. Usual. Um, credential rotations. Rotations. Let me try to align things either. Uh, sorry. This one is an uh, unrelated topic. My bad. So we were able to renew digital ocean personal access token, uh, the credential to spawn as your virtual machine agent on trusted CI, like we do every three months, and the credential used for Azure cred uh, the core release on release CI. Please be careful. Uh, we might have issues, but right now the release is running as expected. So it looks like the new credential are used. Uh, we were able to deliver Maven 399 to the world platform. And as we discussed last week, the new source of truth now is not, for update CLI is not, hey, there is a new Maven 399 release available. And instead it's, hey, look at which Maven version is used on the Jenkins acceptance test harness. So that might introduce a delay between when the new release is available and the moment where we have the pull request. But when the pull request come, it has been tested by real humans. If the version is rollbacked on the ATH, our system will also roll back, propose to roll back and will close the pull request thanks to update CLR work. So thanks, Olivier. Any yeah, question? If, even if we have done the upgrade, and then they choose to change on the ATH, the yes. CLI will propose a new pull request. Absolutely. That's awesome. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, yep. So thanks, folks. Um, we ha So I want to delay the Docker image CD failing. Oh, we have an issue with the repos repository permission updater. It happens that it wasn't infrastructure related. Uh, we had a contributor who helped modernizing the code of the, the Java application running the RPU permissions. And it looks like since his contribution end of May, we never had to create a new plugin. And there was a bug in his contribution that happens. And the edge case was creating a new plugin and defining all the permission on Artifactory. So thanks team for the help. Team uh, rolled back the contribution. We were able to unblock that new plugin release. And I assume they are taking over on the RPU uh, contribution. The contributor was there to help us ask for details for reproduction. So thanks for them for their contribution and their work and being there to help us and sustain the project. No more problem here. The plugin has been released, so we are okay. Um, Jay, can you give us a summary of the uh, as your VM agent in its script not in sync, that task has been done. So can you let us know what you did? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, so based on our meeting the previous week, it was uh, put forward that there was a problem of the Azure script, the init script not being in sync with the Puppet code. So there was a fix that was provided for Linux-based agents, but uh, due to the pre-processing done by Windows agents and uh, Open SSH, the SSH client, so we could we couldn't find a fix for it. Uh, so we'll have to 
remove the default JDK environment variable from all instances of uh, the backer images. And then, yeah, let's see if that rectifies our problem with the Windows agents. So that's the last uh, feat of this issue of adding the JDK agents. I Se think you mix, you mix two issues at the same time. I'm sorry, Jay. That one is... Uh, I... uh, that issue was only about synchronizing the Linux shell script between two controllers. Okay, yeah. No worries. Yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad. So no uh, it's done then for the Linux agents. This issue can be closed. Adding new VM GDKs. See uh, <laughs> above. See below. Uh, thanks for the walk. So that was a tricky thing. Reminder for everyone doing Linux. That's the lesson we learn with this issue. If you change <laughs> a file on slash etc something and you need to restart a service, don't forget to run systemctl daemon reload. There is a routine on systemd that regularly reload the config file in memory for systemd, but usually you prefer forcing it to run before starting or restarting the service. That's what happened with Datadog. We were adding, inserting the API key on the configuration file. And sometimes it was working if the routine was run between writing the file and starting the agent. And sometimes it wasn't. So we fixed two problems at once. We fixed the root cause here by adding a system CTL daemon reload because it was working on CI Jenkins IO. So Jay reused the same code. So thanks Jay for this contribution and fix. And the second thing was we used a subshell with parentheses on the shell scripts, which ensure that the init script continue working even if what is inside the subshell fails. That's different than running just instruction as it or using um, mustache uh, subshell. These are two different ways of using shell. That's advanced shell knowledge, but good exercise for us. Any question? Um, next issue, we were able to decrease the visibility of accounts Jenkins IO by removing index, Google indexing on one, uh, on a whole wiki page. That was the third result when you search for Jenkins account. Now it's, it's not there anymore. And second, we absolutely excluded accounts Jenkins IO from all the Google indexation. So any request Jenkins account, account Jenkins will send you to the proper documentation page instead of, hey, I should create an account on Jenkins IO for my own Jenkins system. So I hope it will have an impact with us having less support to do to people. Let's see. Thanks, Tim, from, from the help. I learned uh, how the uh, Google indexing console service, whatever, I don't know the name of that thing, how it work, because yeah, it's not as simple as adding a robots.txt file as I took initially. <laughs> Listen, learned. Any question? Okay, um, Datadog plugin has been upgraded to its latest version on CI Jenkins IO last week with no issue. Yeah, good job, Datadog maintainers. So that means we can we have CI visibility of pipeline on Datadog. So if you have access to Datadog, you can see our pipeline with how much time did we spend on each of these. We have tracing for pipelines. That's really cool. Um, Mark, so I see the issue is closed. So you confirm we have suspended the distribution of the Windows Slaves plugin after an interesting discussion about Windows 2012 support, right? Well, and me failing to understand Daniel's comment. He made a comment and I, I assumed it was specific and he was using it as a general purpose example. So yeah, that, that, but it, it is now suspended as is the, the one plugin that actually depended on that plugin. Cool. Well, thanks for, for all of this. Um, while we are on permissions, uh, Stefan, you are now a proud administrator. Uh, we have voted for that, I think Thank it was you. in May. And we say, oh, we don't need it uh, right now. But now you are a co-owner. 
I forgot about applying the permission months ago, and it wasn't required. But while I was there uh, revoking access for Hervé, I noticed, oh, I'm alone on this one, except Olivier, Tyler, or the, eventually Daniel Ovadek and some subparts. So yeah, worth having a second person here. Uh, Please why don't not mix more? my uh, authorization with the new spam vector. I'm not in case. In, in <laughs> Good catch. Oh, yes, a random person on the internet. Let's give them administration permissions. I will create a <laughs> call-in account. Go ahead. <laughs> and finally, we were able to update all of our cluster to Kubernetes 1.29. Um, thanks, Jay, for the help here. Great job. Really, really good work that really helped Yeah, me I was the rush small the assistance in this. Mm -hmm. uh, Damien took care of uh, upgrading most of the clusters, so kudos to his work. And actually, it's really, it was done really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> which was pretty impressive. So good work, Damien. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I've updated, we'll see later, I've created an issue for 1.30. We'll discuss that for TriH. One last closed issue, uh, the last one. Uh, while working on, as you will see, the GitHub, uh, where is it? The rate limits on infra CI when scanning repository with GitHub apps. We had GH rate limits and we still have. And uh, during, so we improved the situation, but one of the consequences, I messed up some setup, which has the consequence of failing all of the Docker images during two days. So pull requests for green. The build of the latest tag was green, but the, we lost the ability to push a tag and trigger a tagged release. That has been fixed with the explanation, uh, and that should not happen anymore. If you have any question, I can answer them, but I don't think it's worth digging on the topic. If you think so afterward, don't hesitate to ping me on Jenkins in front. I will give details with pleasure. Did you manage to handle the the lock? The the, the lock. Uh, sorry, you, the rate limit? Uh, no, we will discuss that. It's still in progress. Alas. Uh, we had two issues uh, that we won't work on closed as not planned. One was an account issue. And the other one was I thought we had a credential to rotate, but in fact, the pull request automatic title was misleading. So I've updated the title and closed the issue. It was in fact the trusted CI as your uh, credential. So I closed the issue with no work to do about this. Oh, sorry, what did my screen do? Now about the work in progress. Uh, I want to start with Ubuntu. Yes, I'm the Jenkins Info Officer. I decide on which order do we treat the issues during the meeting. Yes, power. <laughs> so there is a nasty bug on Ubuntu Noble 2404. When you curl some HTTPS servers such as github.com, microsoft.com, and a few others. Small ones. There there, there are, there is a bug if you do is this with curl on IRM64 with Ubuntu Noble, you might randomly have terrible errors about certain uh, TLS connection stopped, and you have errors that say, "Hey, I cannot negotiate TLS, so I cannot answer." If you use WGET, it looks like it's working. If you use Ubuntu 24.10 which is not officially released, but it's early available, that work. And if you use 2310, that also works. Only Noble LTS release, that's quite an annoying bug. Um, it's easier to trigger the bug when emulating ARM64 on another CPU architecture. That's how we had the bug in first, because we were emulating ARM64 to build Docker images. So that means we might have an issue upgrading on 2404. By the way, do we need to do it immediately? That's the real question. Uh, thanks, Stefan, for the, triggering again uh, that question. Do I, we need I'm not to officer, go... but I would ask that, yes. Can, cannot we wait for a few months? So why did we bother and why did we create the issue? Because our contributor worked on upgrading the Docker packaging image used for packaging Jenkins, and they proposed an upgrade to 2404. The main trigger of that particular update was related to some version of the packages. 
they need more modern packages for all the tool stack that we use for testing packages. So that one was needed. So we triggered the Ubuntu 2404 campaign. Now we are using almost everywhere Ubuntu 2204. We have five year LTS. So that means 2404 is not needed immediately. We have three years in front of us. We have, we have at least two pet machine with Ubuntu 20. So we still have one year, no less than one year because uh, end of support is uh, May, 2025. So we will need to do something about that machine before uh, before next spring. And we have update center on 1804. So that one need to be taken care of. Lucky us, we are working on the new update center. So my proposal is, is with this issue is not to work on this issue now and delay that at least until um, let's say beginning of the winter. Is that okay for everyone? No objection? I vote plus one. Yeah, no objection for me, particularly since winter comes to Colorado relatively early. So yeah, <laughs> sure. That, that could, sometimes we have snow in September, Damien, therefore. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. I assume you mean like October or November. Yes, absolutely. Until end of year, as we do not have any more any urgent need yeah so so that doesn't the campaign the the delay on the campaign doesn't prevent us if we need one from having an ubuntu 2404 amd 64 if we needed it right exactly. I mean, this, this is not blocking us it's merely that we're not going to we're going to hope that the ubuntu project will solve this problem in the the ssl problem on curl in the interim and we can we can use that then. In fact, like we're it. lucky Let's that we get alerted on that very small specific bug. That's all. It's fixed at least. Okay. Anything to add on this one? Good. So that one is removed. Okay. Delayed until end of year and curl bug fixed. Uh, next, max mine GYP rate limit it when redeploying mirror bits. So we went to, uh, we realized two weeks ago that for each mirror bit instance, we were having a side container trying to download the, the data every 24 hours or when restarting the container on a new machine, because it was using a local not persisted empty directory. So four time, two deployments or a cluster upgrade and everything was blocked. That one has been done immediately because it was a danger for having get Jenkins you working as expected. During the upgrade of a cluster that could make the mirror bits container refusing to restart. So, we move to, oh, let's have a persistent volume, a tiny one with just the database within. And we mount this on read-only on all the mirror bit instance. So at least mirror bit start, it has data and everything goes right. Now uh, we added a, a fifth service that was a GOIP regular routine using the out of the box image that we used to have. That was easy, just cherry picking the container thing. However, that one is suffering issues when trying to write data directly inside the Samba CFS system. So I've removed this release for now. So no more write access. And the problem we have to solve, we need to re-solve the update problem. Um, while avoiding using uh, as an Azure, oh, an Azure CSI file PVC, because that's the problem. Samba CIFS locks. So multiple solutions here. Uh, we could re-enable the system I was using 
and change the entry point and add a custom shell script that download the data on a temporary directory and then copy it one time, hoping that the one time copy would not would not create a Samba logs. For me, it's too high risk and we will diverge out from the official image because the official image has its own entry point script. So we will need to maintain something. Um, proposal is uh, safer to use a Z copy to copy data in the shared volume. Uh, that's what we do for most of our website. We do uh, this also for update center. So my proposal is to move to a process that use AZ copy. That could be different areas and keep the every 62 hours frequency because MaxMine recommends in order not to eat too much their API to run it twice a week. So 64, 72 hours frequency instead of 24 is way better. So now we can have a, a cron routine somewhere, a cron job on a Linux virtual machine that could be a, a job on Trusted or Infra CI. Or an idea from Stefan, Kubernetes has the concept of cron job, which spin up a pod at regular uh, events. So it's a, it's a kind of a cron job, but distributed and maintained on the cluster. Since the locality of that data is the public cluster, having a cron job on that cluster could make sense. So we could reuse the same persistent volume data and keep updating everything with the same credentials. Yes, also, but the pod yep. will need the right access to the to the volume, so we will yes. turn around. Or the pod could use AZ copy. It already has access, the, the, the keys to access the shared file system, the shared uh, Azure file system are already stored in the cluster. Oh, okay. Because you, so, need it, okay. you need it on CSI to mount the volumes. So the, the pod will not mount the volume. It will use AZ copy to write directly in the, in the shell. Okay. Exactly. So since Stefan is working on his uh, Kubernetes skills, that could be a great exercise, I think. Are you okay and up to the challenge, of Stefan? Of course, I'm always up to the challenge. On pod or on... Do I need to wear a hat or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will, uh, we can sync afterwards, but the idea, Stefan, is first, you might need to roll back. Uh, no, 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 sorry. No, you don't need to roll back anything. You might need to build a custom Docker image though, because you will need a easy copy command line and the GOIP update system. That could be Packer image, that could be something else. You will have to decide. You know, I used already a pod with AZ copy uh, when we were moving around the data from uh, to IAM64 uh, to that bring was... them to standard. So first, that was AirSync. And that, thank was you from... that was not Azzy copy, you're right. And thanks for mentioning it. That was the reason why we were blocked for updating and we detected the 2404. So we are not providing this Docker packaging ARM64 image anymore. You will need a dedicated image for GeoIP. Okay. Uh, any question? Okay, so I propose we keep this issue. Do you think it will be okay, Stefan, for you to work on this in the upcoming week? Yes, I can, I can start, yes. Next one, uh, build stack due to GH API rate limits. So uh, I've, tr I've added a command trying to explain the status. We are not out of the wood. Um, we have improved the situation by spreading the load across different GitHub app. Instead of having one GitHub app for scanning all repositories, we now have one for Docker jobs, one for Terraform, one for update CLI, and a fourth one, that's the, the previous one for the rest. Advantage of this, and it's, it was worth the effort, we can start separating different permissions and we need to go to continue in that direction. For instance, for Kubernetes, we have a private repository. We don't want the credential that allowed to read this private repository to be available from someone else, but it was the case until today. So we need to continue that effort. That will allow us to also separate for all the websites. We would have a scanning credential for pull requests that only have read access 
while we might need write access and other credential when we run the deployment. So running two different folders with two different way of scanning repositories would have different impacts. That also mean we, we improve the, we, we improve the efficiency because the blast radius is decreased. If you reach rate limit for Docker, that won't prevent Kubernetes or Terraform to continue deploying to production. That was the initial reason to split on different GitHub apps. The only real downside is that uh, I learned the hard way that the less repository you cover for a GitHub app installation, the less rate limit credits you have. So by separating, we effectively decreased our rate limit for each of these ones. Yep, magic app. Uh, right now, the next step. So we have clearly improved the situation and we don't have blockers. That, that issue is not a blocker anymore. If we have other more priority, we can spend. However, I have work in progress on two elements I will want to deliver for the upcoming milestone. First one is working on using uh, organization scanning instead of folder. Right now we have folder and we have multi-branches. Advantage of organization scanning when it's applicable is that we can clearly re decrease the amount of scans because the organization scan have this feature saying, hey, do not trigger scans of multi-branch because you have been scanned. And that clearly that allows us to run job DSL reload way more time until we reach the problem. So that one is needed for, for that problem. And it will also up, uh, uh, help us on another issue about separating update CLI and non-update CLI pipelines. And also we have that whole issue about start defining job DSL for the jobs on CI Jenkins IO at least. So we can put it as code that has been requested during the past three years and that will be a nice improvement. So yeah, that one is needed. Uh, and me continuing working on this, I'm almost there. I'm at the I'm at the rate of uh, doing code nitpicking myself on my on my own code, so we are almost there. Also, uh, while working on this, I realized that we have a default setting for each of our multi branch, and it's written in row. We cannot tune it. It's uh, scanning every two hours. Clearly, if we go from two hours to once a day or even once a week for automatic index then that will also push away the moment where we have rate limits. The reason why we have these two hours is because when we did that, we were losing a lot of webhooks due to infra CI taking 20 minutes to restart back in that time. So that's why we add the every two hours to be sure that we don't miss a new branch or a new pull request. That hasn't been the case anymore since quite some months. So my proposal is I will change the pull request, set it to once a day, and we'll see if it improves the situation, but it should be tunable. If we have critical job, we can set a shorter frequency if needed. Does it make sense? Is it clear? And do you have something else to ask on this one? Okay. Uh, the next step is not the most important, but we will have to work on it uh, next month. Uh, we will have to redefine the world build and release Docker images for infra process. That's a shared pipeline library. And right now we complained a lot, me first, and I wrote it, uh, because the process is generating a lot of tags. Usually we merge a pull request and we want it to have CD. So it immediately build the Docker image, push the latest tag, then create a Git tag, push the tag, which trigger a new build of only the tag for the Docker image. So that creates a lot of tag, and we need tag discovery in order to have the, hey, new tag, let's build the associated image. This uh, tag discovery is the root cause of the rate limit here. If we could stop discovering tags for the Docker jobs, at least, that will clearly solve the problem. But that means we need to have discussion about, hey, that means we need to keep the logs on the master branch builds especially because it will it will say, oh, let's determine the, the new version. I got a tag, I create the Git tag, I build the Docker image with that tag, we push everything and that's okay. Less build, less discovery, but we need to keep these logs at least a certain time. 
which leads me to a hey, three years ago when we did that with Olivier, we wanted to keep track of everything. We didn't talk about we will reach 300 tags per repository. So 300 tags, we have 15 repositories. I let you count, that's how we reach the rate limit. Each tag generates one request and we have thousands of requests due to that. Should we keep all of this? That's the question I want to raise now. I don't have an answer, but we must have this, that discussion. How do we decide to clean up all Docker images we don't use anymore and the associated tags? Does it make sense? Do you want to add something? If not, I let you think about that, about how much time is good for you before we start deleting appliances of uh, on Jenkins Infra. Do we need to delete things older than one year, six months, three months, one hour, 10 years? I don't know. Maybe we need to, we need to provide some statistical. If we choose one year, that will erase that much and that will let that much. If we choose six months, mm -hmm. that will do that. That yep. we need we need good points. We need data to yep. choose with data that will help us choose. Absolutely. I'm yeah. sorry because that's work, but I mean yeah, no, but, but that's part. It's not priority, uh, but I want us to work on this on September. That will increase all our efficiency as a team clearly. Because yes. uh, waiting 10, 10 to 15 minutes instead of waiting two minutes, that's clearly changed the way we do operations. So um, I keep this one at least for the work in progress and we will restate uh, that last part if we need to spend some time during next team meeting. Now, I'm not seeing your screen, Damien. Was that intentional? That... It should be. At I least. see. I see the HackMD notes. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I must have changed my configuration. No problem. I'm Sorry stopping for the screen share. No problem. And it, now we don't, and now it's back. And it's back. Ah, okay, great. All right. Um, GSOC. Now, so we have that issue on uh, uh, managed by Hervé and Chris about the new stats. So Hervé helped them fix an issue. And it was so, it was really efficient. It has been confirmed working. So thanks, Hervé, for the work. I keep this one open as a wrapper. We have a new issue on TriEdge about officially switching to the new stats Jenkins IO. So that means uh, we will need in the upcoming week uh, to evaluate do we see less obstacle or things to think about the production for this? And uh, we will should be able to close this issue once we will have moved the DNS to the new system. Uh, so that issue stays on the work in progress and as a wrapper. Uh, Jay, so Jay explained, uh, thanks for explaining us the status of the GDK21 agents. So as he explained, uh, Windows SSH agent we are work in progress, and Jay is currently working on removing default GDK from Packer image templates. That will solve that last issue. So almost there. I believe we should have something in the upcoming weeks. Did I miss something, Jay? Anything else to add on the GDK 21? Cool. So let's continue. Work. Thanks. Um, as I said, IRM64 mirror bits runs with IRM64 since eight days. One less VM to pay for. Uh, next candidate is LDAP. We have an IRM64 image, but we have a word behavior. Uh, need LDAP image and version updates. I propose to delay this one. Uh, we won't be able to work on it right now. I propose we delay for September because we have a lot of other tasks for this week. Is that okay for everyone? Yes. Update CLI, separate pipelines and organization scanning. Same thing, let's delay because we need to solve the GitHub rate limits as we need to finish the org scanning and chart for infra CI. Okay, for everyone, no question. 
Finally, the new update center. A lot of things. Um, no more 503 errors. We added a fallback. So the East US thing has been added as a fallback, which means during the, ten, the tiny windows, as we discussed last week, that we can have a 10 seconds to 60 seconds time where it's currently being updated. So the mirror does not have the same checksum compared to the files because it has not finished the scan yet, but the file has been updated. In order to be sure we don't have any problem, we have set up a fallback mirror. And if you have a request, the request is served blindly, which means we serve stale data. By stale data, we mean, we mean update center JSON file that are maximum five minutes old. That's absolutely acceptable compared to having 503 errors when requesting update center index. Uh, eight, eight days without errors. Uh, we have a lot of, we had a lot of mirror bits uh, fixes. So we had the GOIP, configuration tuning, IRAM64, uh, working well. Now the next step, uh we I want I will want to schedule a brownout of one hour uh this week. And we also need to finish the, to work on the Redis issue, which is on uh triage later. Is there any objection if I propose a one hour uh a one hour brownout this Friday morning? So that will be 8 a.m. UTC to 9 a.m. UTC, 10 a.m. my time. Before the Redis? The yes. Question? Yes. Okay. The goal is to have live data to see how the cluster perf uh, behave. Okay. ACP, um, public ACP removed from cluster. We have space for network peaks now. Uh, and brownout proposal one hour this Friday. So Mark, I believe I need to announce it on the blog post at least, uh, developer and usual mailing lists. Are there other areas where we should think about announcing? Uh, Status.jenkins.io, of course. So status and blog posts all seem great to me. And the, ch the time you've chosen is, is fine. I won't be awake at that time. So, but then oh. again, I'll be on vacation. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. I will yeah, be but... in Alaska. I will be even less awake than, than I would have normally been awake. Uh, I was hesitating between morning and afternoon. I think uh, one hour with only European and Asia should be enough without right. uh, US. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see the behavior. Great. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. And yes, it's and been that, working. That, that... Oh. No, you started. Go ahead. It's been working great for me. I've I've used the DNS change to make sure that all of my use and I see it going to the places I expected and doing the things I expected. So I'm I'm quite pleased. We agree that eight UTC it's nine Paris time. It's ten. We have 10 price time. So that means that, uh, uh, yes, it's better to do that way because we got the whole day to, to look at the stats and the, and the logs. Exactly. Later. And then and on Friday. The, the plan is, uh, so a first, first brownout of one hour. Then uh, idea is to have a second brownout of one hour with US next week. Then one full day run out. The one full day will also help us to see how, how does it behave on long term because one hour should be okay, but not a full day. And that will also give us be a billing indication. Once the billing on AWS will be aggregated, we will see a full day absolute decrease on the AWS cloud bill. And uh, how do you want to handle the Redis migration and performance and... improvement? We change Redis. We wait five minutes and it's fixed. <laughs> no, okay. I'm I'm serious. Redis here is a cache and a database at the same time. We have the update center that scan the two mirrors every five minutes. So worst case, let's say we 
it's our full operation. We accidentally delete all of the data in Redis and we, we have to start a brand new instance. You wait five minutes. And it's done. And it's done. Eventually, you need to run the two mirror bits at the command to add back the mirrors. So the scan will scan both mirrors. That's the only thing. The interesting part, since we have added the fallback, that means even if you remove all the Redis yeah, about that will fall data, back on the east one. it will fall back. So we will still have something serving request in the end. Really nice. Because you don't need it to be on Redis and it's on configuration state, not on Redis state. So we can do whatever method we want, migrating or not the data. And uh, I'm interested in trying the worst case scenario. Let's break update center now, since we will do this out of the brownouts, and we see how it behave. Agreed. Any question? Nope, okay. So we have a few issues on the triage. Uh, the first one is uh, credential expiry. So new uh, uh, add to milestone. That one we have to work on uh, the CRL expire. Um, OSS Planet went back to me and said, hey, we have added our sync at HTTPS, so we should be able to add uh, yet another download mirror for get Jenkins IO. Good news, thanks to them. Uh, so I'm adding that to the milestone. That should be a quick one. Um, the re so we have the issue about replacing stats Jenkins IO. Uh, so that one I had to milestone. I will need to sync with Hervé to see how much plan and thing he has and how much do we have to take care as a team, especially how much time before we remove the whole stats because we will do blue, green, most probably. Do we need to do brownouts as well? So we need to define a plan. Migration plan. Is that okay for everyone? Uh, get Jenkins IO, the infamous issue about cost and Redis instance. So problem number one, both of our Redis instances used by get and updates, they are public facing. We don't have any kind of IP block. We are only protected by Redis password, which is a big inconvenience that we need to solve. Second thing, Redis supports different databases. There are no problem, technically speaking, if we use the same Redis instance with two different databases for the two services. Challenge number one, we need to sum up the accesses to the database from both services. And update Jenkins IO, we don't know yet the impact on Redis, so we need to have some margin. And second challenge, we cannot have different accounts with different passwords. You have only one password and every application can access both databases. So if we messed up the databases, we can accidentally delete data. So I've put metrics, details, recommendation by Azure. And the last step is that uh, team pointed at why don't we use the sponsored subscription so we won't have to pay to Redis until we have exhausted the subscription. That will avoid trying to optimize as much as possible and we can continue using premium Redis instance. I think that's a good idea that will let us with the current rates of the subscription account, we can expect having Redis working for four to six months. So if it's okay for everyone, I propose we go that way. We create the new instance on the new subscription. We make it available on the public cluster and we migrate update Jenkins IO. Once it's done, then we discuss how do we do for get Jenkins IO. Any question, objection, if we add this to the milestone? Stefan, if it's okay for you, I propose we pair on this one, but I will want you leading this one that will be adding new resources on Azure, and then we can sync. Is that okay for you? And that will be okay, of course, yes. Um, we had a new issue about Gradle plugin uses proprietary dependency, quite the annoying one for everyone here. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for taking care of this one. Uh, Mark, is that okay if we keep this one unassigned, but in on the milestones, we will have to follow up. We had an answer by Oleg. Um, Daniel says we don't need to remove access immediately. 
but we need to let time to Gradle to find a solution and see. Um, and yes, so I believe the board might want to discuss this. I don't know if it's worth escalating to the board or just waiting. Yeah, but I think Daniel's, I'll certainly send a message to the board, but Daniel's response, hey, give them two weeks to do investigation to see if they can find a solution seems very reasonable to me. This is this is not something where we need to act like it's an emergency. It's just, yeah, they've he's detected a problem and they're actively working to investigate the problem and see if they can find a way to, to resolve it. Thanks. Um, okay, so that one was GSOC. So GSOC, uh, we have two requests about hosting repositories. Uh, code repositories from the GSOC. One looks good, so I would, the third one, I'm not sure. First step, plugin modernizer tool. Uh, Tim resumed that I agree with Tim. Uh, that GSOC project code will generate tooling that will be used by the Jenkins infra to provide to the contributors. So that makes sense to have it under the GitHub organization Jenkins infra. It's not directly consumed by Jenkins user. As such, we don't need it to have under Jenkins CI GitHub organization. Any objection on this one? So I will take care of this one. Um, same for another project, and I have mixed feeling about this second one. Uh, it's about an L, uh, the project enhancing existing LLM model with domain-specific Jenkins knowledge. The question here, I'm not sure is, is that tool being consumed by Jenkins Infra for Jenkins contributor or directly by Jenkins user? I'm not really sure. So I need help to decide this. So this is the the, the modernizer? No, no, no. It's a second GSOC project. It's the LLM model domain specific ah, one. Got it. OK. So if it's okay, I thought Bruno, uh, so since Bruno cannot be there today, I propose I will restate the the reasoning that the team explained on the other issue. And we will contact Bruno to help us, Bruno and Chris, so they can help us decide. Is that okay for everyone? Um, and finally, we have that request. Uh, so about the GSOC project, Related to the repository permission updater. So I have details. I asked for more detail. They will want to use Terraform in order to keep track of the permission of which Jenkins contributor has which permission on which Jenkins project. Right now, it's using a bunch of YAML on the RPU repository, and we have a script regularly running. These scripts, even on the modernization project on GSOC, they rely on the previous version not failing or, or because it has a, a previous known state, right? And the uh, team started to draft, uh, let's say the scope of, hey, let's use Terraform because Terraform has resources to define GitHub permission and team membership. So that means we might want to add that as a Terraform project. We could benefit from what we already did for the infra, however, the accesses will be a bit different, particularly the state part. We need a private and shared state as per team answer, but we don't need them to be on the Terraform private state like the infrastructure. It's not the same critical level. It's still critical because if you have access to the state and can write it, then you can change the permission effectively. So it still have to be on different areas. So we will have to find a proper balance on that area and I will add it on the milestone and discuss it with Tim. Stefan, I might need your help. We might have to work on Terraform modules in order to create resources on the Azure project. So I believe after the Azure task you are, I've asked you to run, we I will prepare this with Tim and we might then hand over to you for creating the resources on Terraform. Don't forget that my knowledge and module on Terraform are quite low. Yes, that's the reason, because that's a way to learn it the, the good and efficient way. OK. Finally, two issues. I propose to delay the first one of uh, to September. That will be start a new AKS cluster on the sponsored account. 
uh, for private cluster in order to make it way more modern, uh, specifically the network and access configuration. And we won't pay InfraCI or release CI uh, virtual machine until we run out of credits. My proposal, let's delay until mid-September, so more than two weeks, when we'll see a plan for credits. AWS, DO, Azure. Because if we had too much on the credits, we are with 10K per month on that account, we will run out of credits in January. And we have credits until May. So depending on how we move and decide to move things, that might be a good idea or not. Is that okay for everyone? And finally, upgrade to Kubernetes 1.30. I propose to delay to January unless we need it earlier. You can challenge this thing. It's because uh, 1.29 is deprecated on Amazon and Azure in March and DigitalOcean end of February. So that means we should be able to do it on January. However, we might need to do it earlier based on uh, the Kubernetes plugin updates and other work that we could have. So at least not before uh, September, October. Is that okay? Delay at least until October. Anything else? Okay, I'm just checking the issues. If we don't have one, sorry, it was a bit long, even if I prepared. I don't see new issues. Do you have something else to add or should we jump on updating milestones? Good for everyone? Okay, so I'm stopping screen share. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for all that.